you have a Bible, please turn with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 14, verse 17, the two Bible, it's on page 949, verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Our Lord, even as we sing that final song of invitation, of exclamation about coming to behold the wondrous mystery. Lord, we approach this morning with worship and awe and wonder, in fact, at the mystery of the kingdom of God and the mystery of the king of kings coming into our world, bringing righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, coming and joining humanity in order to save us from the inside out to save us from ourselves and to ransom and redeem us unto yourself. And Lord, so even as we sing these songs or as we are about to meditate on this passage of Scripture, I pray that the wonder and the mystery of Christ and the cross and the good news of the gospel would grip and seize our souls and capture the imagination of our minds and our hearts and that we would be drawn ever more and anew and again to you, that our hearts would be heated with the flame of your spirit and heated with the fires of worship that would fuel us as we seek to live our lives for you, as we walk out the doors and go about the coming week and the rest of our lives and whatever days we're given and whatever lies ahead, that we would live our lives for your glory and fueled by your power in the world to live for you and to bring honor and glory to you. And I pray that now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, if you've been with us, you know that toward the end of the year, we had a series, my sermon series, has been the topic of the kingdom of God. And this is now more or less sort of the final installment of all that we had some hiccups along the way, so I wasn't initially planning for this to come all the way to January, but I just wanted to land and end here in sort of a brief meditation on this passage as we consider these ideas about the nature of the kingdom of God and, and God's activity through his kingdom in our world. When we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the rule and reign of the king of kings over heaven and earth, over all creation. And in particular, as it appears in the life of the ministry and the teaching of Jesus, we're talking about the kingdom of God as God's rule and reign is invading the world in a new and real way, first in the life and ministry of Jesus, and then as that plays out, we get the, the foretaste of that all along the way, and then finally as that is consummated at the second coming of Jesus, when the rule and reign of Jesus over our world is no longer disputed or rivaled or questioned by rebellious mankind or angels of any demonic sort or any opposition in the world. But all things will one day come into full submission to the King of Kings at the end of the age. And so that is uh, what we've been talking about. Jesus taught about the Kingdom of God. He demonstrated it through the various miracles that he performed, even rising from the dead, showing that Death ultimately does not have the final say. There's no power over God in his ability to bring his kingdom to fruition in our lives. And so here, this morning, we read again from Paul's words in Romans. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, this verse here in Romans, we touched on this uh, last year. If you remember when I went through the book of Romans, <laughs> I worked on that for uh, the better part of last year. 
And, and we touched on this, and, and, and if you remember sort of the context of this portion of the book of Romans, uh, what we talked about then is the book of Romans largely can be broken into two big categories. The first half of the book of Romans, chapters 1 through 11, are a lot of theology and doctrine, where Paul is teaching about the nature of God and the nature of humanity and, and the need and the provision of God in the gospel, and really just exploring all those doctrinal and theological themes. But beginning in chapter 12, and to the end of the book of Romans, not that there's not theology and doctrine in that, in that section, but really it's the application of all of those things to our lives as as Christians, it's really applying those realities. It's bringing the implications of the gospel home to us. And so here in this verse and in this section of scripture, Paul is in the middle of applying and bringing to the forefront the implications of the gospel. And specifically what's happening here in chapter 14 is Paul is weighing in on what seems to be a dispute between the Jewish and the Gentile Christians about the nature of the kosher uh, mosaic food laws and how we're supposed to relate to those. And, and who's spiritual and who's not, and who's strong and who's weak, depending upon how you fall out in your choices in that regard. And so what Paul is addressing is this question of who's eating and drinking what and, and what is considered spiritual or strong among believers. And then about this time, Paul mercifully cuts through the fog of these types of questions because this section is sort of heavy with, you know, the questions about do's and don'ts and, and, and how we live these things out in our lives. <coughs> and Paul brings this clarifying comment, and he says, just in case you're confused by our conversations here about food and drink, about do's and don'ts, about activities, whether they're righteous or not, or how we conceive of all that. Just in case you're confused, Paul cuts through the fog here and he says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but it is a matter of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So there's this clarifying statement before he continues I think, lest we be confused. And it has to do with the kingdom of God, which is why we're reading it here this morning. But Paul's comment is first, it's not that, but it is primarily this. It's not primarily a question about what we eat and what we drink. Eat this, don't eat that, drink this, don't drink that. Rules and regulations, do's and don'ts, religious checklists and to-do lists and so on and so forth. But Paul says, clearly, the kingdom of God is not that, but it is a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And what I just want to do this morning is quickly kind of have a meditation on that. As we kind of conclude and wrap up and put a bow on our considerations of the kingdom of God in this way. So what Paul says here, aside from what he says, is not going on is he clearly says the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness. The kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness. Now, we can look at this from really two main angles, and that's what I want to do. And Because first and foremost, I think this is everything. Like, the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness. And, and, and everything else that he says about it flows out of that reality. Because here's the reality. First off, we're sinful broken, unclean, unholy, unrighteous people like us. The kingdom of God is a matter of the gifted, unchanging, vicarious, holy righteousness of Jesus Christ to us from God as an act of infinite, extreme, amazing, astounding grace. Amen? Yeah. Amen? The kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness. And we can consider this as it relates to, as it affects our relationship to God and 
as it affects the way we live out the Christian life as a result. So let me just quote from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where the Apostle Paul elsewhere is commenting on these things. He said, God made him who knew no sin, that would be Jesus, he made him to be sin for us, that's you and me, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this. Did you get up this morning and think, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ? When you look in the mirror, do you see yourself as righteous? I mean, like, you know, we, you know, if a surfer catches a wave, he's like, righteous, dude, you know. I mean, that was, maybe that's old still. I can show my age. But, but the reality is, this is what theologians refer to as the great exchange. You've likely heard me talk about this before. It's the idea that in the gospel, Jesus comes to us and he exchanges our sinful, guilty brokenness for his unbroken holiness and righteousness. His, indeed, his righteous life, not only his righteous death, but also, also his righteous life. And he exchanges that, swaps it with us. And such that it actually belongs to us, the Bible says, so that we would become the righteousness of God in Christ. You know, often, whenever we consider the righteous life of Jesus, or the sinless life of Jesus, I think we often primarily think of it in terms of the prerequisite for the cross. Like, for Jesus to die for simple people and to count, he had to have been sinless, right? And, and that's actually true. Okay, that's not a problem that we believe that. But we stop there. You know, it's not, so the righteous life of Jesus, the holy, uh, sinless, flawless life of Jesus, was not simply the precondition to his, be, his ability to die in our place, but it is also something that he swaps, exchanges, trades with us. The fact that he lived a righteous, sinless, perfect life is something he also gives us as a substitute. And so we think of it in terms of his death as our substitute, and we're right to do so, but his life also was lived in our place. You know, perhaps you've heard the analogy, you've likely, if you've been around here, you've heard me give the analogy of the courtroom of God. Often we talk about the, the gospel in these legal terms because the Bible uses this analogy. <clears throat> and so it's this idea that we would say, uh, look, just picture someone who's guilty and indebted uh, before a court of law, let's say God's court of law. And what happens in the gospel and at the cross is that the judge stands up, says, you know, the, the, the ruling is guilty. And the judge pulls out his wallet, pays the fine, or goes to jail for the, for the, the criminal, and then the criminal goes free. And, and we say, that, that is a, an example of the cross. And, and, and that's absolutely an example of the cross, but we often stop there. We don't take the analogy to all of its full conclusions if we want to fully understand the nature of the gospel, because here would be sort of the full analogy in this regard. Let's say if you imagine uh, in a court of law, there is an individual who spent an entire life, like at the end of life, and, and has spent an entire life uh, both intentionally and unintentionally evading taxes. Okay, and so what actually comes at the end of his life is he realizes, him or her, that this person realizes that all these taxes are owed and there's no way to pay that. And so he's guilty and indebted and standing guilty before the court of law. And so what happens in the gospel is not only the, the Lord would stand up and say, I'm paying the fine so that it's all taken care of, and I declare you now guilty, you can, uh, free, you can go your own way, I absolve you. So it, it doesn't, the analogy doesn't just stop there. What, what happens in the gospel is this. The Lord, as the judge, rightly declares us guilty because we are. But then he pays the fine or he takes the penalty. And then what, what we miss is it's not that we leave the courtroom of God with a zero balance. I mean, if you've ever been in debt, who loves a zero balance? Right, zero balance is great, okay? But 
what happens in the gospel is we're not only absolved of the death that is owed, but the judge himself then deposits like $500 trillion in our bank account, adopts us into his family, and then moves us into his house. Okay, this is sort of the full analogy of the gospel, and so we, we don't always go to that end, but here's the reality is that at the cross and in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have not just had our guilty penalty zeroed out. We have had that. But then the king of kings who has endless resource has deposited trillions of dollars worth of righteousness and holiness and justification into our account so that we leave phenomenally wealthy. We entered guilty and indebted. And in the red, and we leave. Not only just to sort of go on our own way and hope that the law doesn't catch up with us, but we go our own way with a new identity and a new bank account, if you will. And we're wealthy beyond belief. And it's all a matter of gift and grace, unearned, undeserved. And it changes everything about us. It's a new identity, a new resource, and, and a new relationship. Okay, so to me, I just wanted to say that's really the full analogy if you want to make that speak to the nature of the gospel. Amen. 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 So clean slate, new identity, and massively wealthy spiritually beyond anything that we could ever imagine. The Bible would call it righteous. Uh, the Bible would refer to Christians as saints. Often we think of saints as uniquely holy people who maybe have two or three uh, miracles to their name. But the Bible doesn't use the term saint in that way. The Bible, the, the word saint, literally means holy one, and that's the way the Bible refers to Christians. That, that's the way the Bible refers to you and to me. And perhaps that's astounding or even audacious. I mean, it certainly feels that way for me or for you to say, to say well, I, you know, the Bible says I'm a saint. Because we think of saints as all these saintly creatures, and, and we know that we're not like that, right? We're innately, we're not saintly. Right. And that's why, theologically, we refer to this kind of righteousness as an alien righteousness, or a foreign righteousness. It's not our own. It doesn't come from us. It's not a resource we have or possess. It's one that is granted and gifted and given, laid upon, placed within declared about us, made true to the end by someone who has all the ability to actually pull that off. So it doesn't come from us. It comes from the Lord who is a gracious and merciful and just God. Let me read some other words from Paul earlier in the book of Romans when he talks about these things. We'll be in chapter 5 a little bit, but in chapter 5, verse 19, Paul says this, for as by one man's disobedience, he's referring to Adam, our first father, for as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Okay, so Adam sinned and all of creation with him, and then we as his great, 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 great grandchildren, we all follow naturally and spiritually in his path. Just as Adam's disobedience led to all of us becoming Sinners as we are, so by one man's obedience, that would be the obedience of Jesus, the many, that would be those of us that trust in Christ, anyone who places their hope and faith in him, the many will be made righteous as through the righteous life of Jesus, the active, flawless holiness of Jesus, and the substitutionary sacrificial death of Jesus transfer to our account all of the merit and all of the flawless holiness of Jesus, tons of it placed in your account and mine. So if you were able to go online and check your spiritual bank account, you ever do this? Do you guys do online banking? And you go, well, I wonder if I can afford that. You go, to, you know, what's my, not just, you know, did I add it all up right? What's the bank say I've got? Well, if there was a spiritual way to type it in, the sum would be, you know that sideways eight? What does that mean? Infinite, right? Okay, that's with a dollar sign or whatever the spiritual monetary <laughs> symbol would be. Okay, uh, the analogy. Tons 
of righteousness have been deposited in your account. More than you can ever fathom or get your mind around. And this is why the Bible says that God, through the gospel, considers you holy. The phrase we use for this, and the Bible uses for it, we'll read it in a moment, is the word justified. Justified. It has the word justice in it. So it's just. This is right. It's righteous. And, and the way to understand this concept, I've used this before, is uh, the idea of just, the word justified. The best way to understand this word is to understand it this way. God treats me, he relates to me, he views me, just as if I never did all the simple things I have done. Or, to the other side, you might say, God treats me, relates to me, loves me, approves of me, just as if I had lived the perfect, flawless, righteous, sinless life that Jesus actually did. And that's what it means that we are justified by God, before God, that he delays to us that way. Is that good news? Yeah. Yeah, amen. So let's read a little further in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 and 6 and 11, where Paul is further elaborating on these things. Chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So our faith is the thing that's active is that we place our faith in Christ. When we turn from our sin and our own lack of resource, and we say, I need a Savior, we trust in Him, that's the extension of our faith. And since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're no longer in war with Him. We're no longer in hostility with him. We still do sinful things, but we're not, we're gradually now on the same team. We're part of the same family. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And as a result, we rejoice in hope of the glory of Almighty God. Verse 6. <coughs> For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps, though, though, sorry, let me read that again. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die, just humanly speaking. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were ungodly, unrighteous, unholy, not good people, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood and his death, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received reconciliation. The kingdom of God is not primarily consist of, made up of, concerned with eating and drinking rules and regulations. It has to do with the astounding amazing, infinite grace of God in the matter of righteousness. You know, the mystery and the wonder of it is not only that, that God treats us this way, that relates to us this way, declares us to be this, this way by his infinite power and wisdom, as though that were not enough. What happens next, and the other aspect of this righteousness, is that the Lord actually, tangibly, really, then moves by the power of His Spirit to place that kind of righteousness in us, in a way that begins to manifest itself in our lives, from the inside out. And this is the an aspect of, part of, the role of the Holy Spirit in our life. It's a, kingdom of God, it's not about these things, but it is about this 
righteousness, joy, peace, what? In the Holy Spirit, which is where? In you and me. Of course, the Spirit of God, we would clearly say, is everywhere, but uniquely and manifestly, the Bible is clear, for those that trust in Jesus and have been born again to a new and living hope, the Holy Spirit indwells you. And this is not like some unholy spirit, like a demonic force. It's not some unholy spirit like yours and mine by nature. This is the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. The holy, righteous, flawless, unique Spirit of Almighty God that indwells those that trust in Christ. And that holiness does not appear without effect. It has an effect from the inside out. We've already talked uh, more than once, I think, about Jesus' teaching on the nature of the kingdom of God. One of the ways he taught about this, he said the kingdom of God is like leaven. Right, or yeast in a batch of dough. What is it? It's sort of hidden. It's unseen by and large. And as it's worked into the dough, what happens? It's extremely active. It's prolific in its effect. And it's visual. You can actually see and experience the effect of that little bit of yeast or leaven that's into the dough. And in the same way, the kingdom of God comes in our world in general like that, sort of hidden, invisible, unseen. Even at Christmas, we talk about the birth of Jesus and the manger and this little baby out of you know, out of the way of Bethlehem. But but not just like in general, out in the world. But in particular, as the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God comes to indwell you and me, what happens is the extremely active and prolific nature of the kingdom of God and of the Spirit of God wells up in us in such a way that it has an effect in our entire lives from the inside out. It's a transformative effect. If you've ever raised a batch of bread dough, and you can see and smell, and later on you can taste and feel and experience the effect that it has. And in the same way, the Spirit of God, the Kingdom of God, as it comes in us by the presence of the Holy Spirit, it has this kind of effect. It's righteousness first. It flows out into peace and joy, as well as other things. We can talk about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Whenever Paul later on, I think in Galatians, Galatians, Ephesians, I think Galatians, when he talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, what, what is fruit? It's the produce of a thing, right? Ultimately, it's the produce, the byproduct of the presence of a, of a nature, of like a tree or a plant. It produces after its own kind. And the Holy Spirit produces what? Paul said, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. These things are not things that characterize us by nature. You know, by and large, those aren't the things that just naturally flow out of me. Okay, like like we talked about. We're not just so many angelic little saintly beings in and of ourselves, but the nearness of holiness. So close that it's closer to us than we are. The Spirit of God is so really actively inside of us that it cannot help but manifest in our lives with transformative ways of bringing out of our sort of uh, ruins, the ruins of kind of our nature and life, what it brings out things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, gentleness self-control, all of these things that are extrinsic to us. They're not natural to us. These are manifestations of the Spirit of God. So whenever you in your life, you begin to see that sort of come out of you, even if it's sort of halting and it's not as fast or as much as you'd like to see. But anytime you see it, you can be sure God is at work. God is not only at work, but he's also here and near and really active in my life. You can point to that. Take encouragement to see. When I see the fruit of the Spirit, say, you know what? That's not me. That's, that's God. God is near. He must be. Or I wouldn't think or act that way. Because that's not me by nature. So it reminds us of the nearness of the presence of God. Now, this is uh, the what we refer to this process of the righteousness of Jesus in us by the Spirit coming out of us as a manifestation of the Spirit. This is the process we call sanctification. It's sort of the sanctifying effect of the presence of God in us and the justification of God in and over our lives where we're declared righteous and righteousness is put in us it has an effect upon us that sanctifies. And it's sort of a holy making effect. And however slowly it may be, this is a process that will play out throughout the course of our lives 
until the day that we die or the Lord comes back. And that's the day that that process stops. And then the hard labor is over. And what will happen, whether it's at the end of our lives, when we go to meet the Lord, and, you know, we, we depart this world and to be with Jesus, or he comes back and makes all things new and us along with it. And then at that point, the righteousness, body, and soul are fully manifest. No longer separate, no longer a struggle, no longer halting and stalling and sort of, you know, crawling along the way. But, but a complete project. No longer a work in progress. You know, if you look at my life too closely, what you see dramatically is a work in progress. And maybe you don't have to look closely at all. But a work in progress. Well, that's what we are. It's a work in progress. And at the end of the age, if we die and go to be with the Lord, or He comes back and makes all things new, what will happen is we will be perfect and perfect in Him. That process will have found its fullness at the coming of the kingdom of God in its consummation. So the result of this is that in our Christian lives, you know, so often we're, we're drawn to, kind of back to where we started, we're, we're drawn to sort of a, a works-based religious approach to spiritual things because we're insecure about the love of God or we're insecure about the righteousness that He has granted to us. We, we have fear about that. We fear that I've gone too far or, or I've blown it one too many times. We, we, so we're, we're operating out of insecurity and fear and, and so we're tempted to so often live our Christian lives as though we're trying to either earn God's favor or keep and preserve God's favor. Like it's always in question. And, and what this passage and what these truths remind us is that we do not live our lives. We do not live the Christian life. We don't, we don't ask questions about do's and don'ts. We do ask questions about do's and don'ts, but we don't ask them from a, a position of insecurity. We don't ask them about approval. How do I get God's approval? We, we live our Christian lives from the position of approval. We are children of the King of Kings first adopted into his family, and then supernaturally born literally again by the Spirit of God into his family. And so it's just like, you know, if you're a child or you have children or if you were a child and you ever disobeyed your parents, anybody here ever disobeyed your parents? You can say, okay, got a hand in the back? No, I didn't. <laughs> so... Anytime I ever disobeyed my parents, which were men, I never became not their child. You know? And, and so it has an I mean it had an effect on my relationship with my parents. Sometimes it had an effect on my backside. But the effect is experiential of our communion and our fellowship with God. So sin has an effect. The do's and the don'ts and the pra practical questions of how you live out the Christian life, it, it has an effect on our experience of God, and it has an effect upon our, our peace and our joy and our satisfaction in Christ. And it's, it, it has that kind of effect, but but it never changes our position. Uh, we, we, we trust in God. We follow Jesus. We seek to live righteous, holy lives, not because we're seeking his approval, but indeed because we have. And because we have it, because we live out of approval, we're actually able to pursue God because there's nothing standing our way. We fall, stumble, struggle. It's not like, oh my gosh, I just lost everything. It's like, no, we know that he loves us, cares for us, picks us up, carries us, and carries on with gladness as our Father in heaven who loves us and has given us everything. We're written into his will. We're, inherit we're his inheritors. He's deposited in our accounts and he's adopted us into his family. We are loved because of Jesus, because of his sacrificial death, yes, but also because of his holy and righteous life. The kingdom of God is not merely a matter of righteous acts, but it is a matter of righteousness. And that has an effect on our peace 
and our joy that are manifestations, I think, of that. So when we think about this, if we're trying to kind of operate from, uh, for approval and not from the approval of God, we have insecurity and fear towards God. And frankly, I think it breeds even towards other people, suspicion, accusation, judgment, and division as we're either better than or worse than others, or we're trying to one-up, or we're more spiritual. I mean, that's the context of Romans 14. Who's more spiritual? Who's stronger? Who's weaker? We're trying to get the pecking order all in, in line, but when we realize we are true sons and daughters of God, because of the righteous life of Jesus, what we can do then is all together we celebrate the goodness of God. And we have each other's backs and brothers and sisters. You know, we say in our world, blood's thicker than water. You know, meaning family, you know, comes first. You know, you can mess, you know, my family can give me a hard time, but nobody messes with my family. Well, in Christ, we are family. And we are related more closely to blood. We're related through the blood of Jesus. Amen. So, uh, let me read here as we begin to close. Uh, again, Romans 5, verse 1 and 10 to 11. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. While we could explore a lot more of these ideas of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, I think the thing to recognize as we saw in the life and ministry of Jesus, is Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. He taught about these things. But then he also demonstrated. We saw the miracles of Jesus, a foretaste of what would come when the kingdom of God was fully manifest. What would that look like? Sin would be forgiven and eradicated. What would that look like? It looked like this. Dead people would come back to life again. What did that look like? Sick people would no longer be ill. Even the even like leprosy and these sort of horrible curses, they would be lifted off people's bodies because in the kingdom to come, those things will be no more. As Revelation tells us, at the end, death itself is going to die. That's Romans. But at the end, it says that sorrow and suffering and sighing, all of these things are going to flee away from the presence of God. And we see these foretastes that speak to us and remind us of what the full manifestation of the kingdom of God will be like. And we take courage in the here and the now as we sample and taste that. So the righteousness of Jesus that, that touches our souls now, begins in ways to manifest, will only be more fully realized when the kingdom of God has completely and fully come. Our peace that we sense now, let's say you trusted in Christ and you sense in a new way a peace in your soul and your mind. The Bible calls it the peace that passes understanding. It's not dependent on your circumstances. It's not because you figured out how to, how to make it all work. It's dependent upon Christ and his glory, his ability to make it all work. And we taste that. You know, I remember as a brand new Christian, one of the things that amazed me most was the peace that I found in Christ. And it wasn't based on anything in my circumstances or life, but it was something that just sat on me. And I was astounded by that because I realized as the peace of God kind of took over my heart and mind, I realized that I had never really been at peace in my heart and mind. And, and it, that amazed me. So peace and, of course, joy that flows out of that. And as we sample and we taste peace with God, peace within ourselves, peace even with other people sometimes, okay, that comes by the grace of God in our lives. As we experience the, the joy of the gospel kind of alighting on our souls, the reality is these things are foretastes of what will perfectly define us at the end of the age when the kingdom of God has fully come. And so encourage yourself with that. This is why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other earthly concerns will be added to you. And, and I just want to end with this, just say, you know, as we as we live our lives, you know, I know we've got we're a mixed crowd of people here in this, in this meeting. We've got a mixed crowd of people perhaps listening later on. 
So I don't know where you are this morning or in your life, what the dominant concern or fear or struggle that you have in this regard is. But perhaps, you know, you really sense kind of an insecurity with God and righteousness seems like something that is that is far away. You question and worry and, and fear about sort of the the nature of your relationship with God. How secure is that? And or how secure am I? And, and it leads you at times to, to really labor and, and try and then at other times to despair because you can't ever measure up or earn God's faith. You can't get there. And so we do one or the other. You know, we just burden and labor ourselves to the end or we, we throw up our hands and just say, I, I can't. You know, maybe, maybe that's you. And righteousness is something that needs to set and settle in your soul. Security and approval. And perhaps it's it's peace about your circumstances. Or peace about eternity. Or peace about things you don't understand. Or maybe it's joy. You know, you feel like your joy has been robbed or by your circumstances or your life. You feel like joy is something that's not defined in your soul. Um, whatever it is, I want to submit to you this morning that I think the answer to begin with is here, that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking or religious do's and don'ts, but it is a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And the starting point is seeking first the king and his kingdom. And all these things will be added to you. I want to read one more verse and then we'll be done. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. And in this you rejoice, though for now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes, even though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray.